Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our weekly workshop. So we have some special guests with us tonight. First, we have Suprio Roy, who is the CEO and founder of Atrium. Atrium is a crypto native network of independent artists and creators that has this new work model disrupting the legacy way of long form production. We also have Billy Dow, who is an incredible generalist in the film industry. He's been responsible for a number of blockbusters that you might have already seen. I know I've seen movies like Deadpool, Ant-Man, Spider-Man, etc. So in this session uh, titled The Future of Work, Equitable and Global Employment Opportunities, we are giving you an in-depth look at how blockchain paves the way for fair and widespread opportunities for artists and creators globally in particular to the long form production model. My name is Tina and I am your UE host for this evening. Uh, I've been an early stage venture investor for the last five years, most recently focused on crypto applications. And prior to that, I got my career started in product and strategy. So just to give you a quick layout of this session, for the first part of the workshop, we will start off with a talk from Suprio, and then we will hear more from Billy. Then we'll dive into your questions on how Atrium is a game changer in shifting the way that legacy models work to a more dynamic and inclusive decentralized employment model. And so as a reminder, again, this session's recorded. To be a active UETH chapter, please uh, comment within 24 hours of this workshop in our Discord. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in our general channel or on YouTube. And we can address questions live. And for the questions that we don't cover, we can address those asynchronously. So here at the University of Ethereum, our intention with the workshop um, is to inspire our chapter members with real life examples so that you can jump into projects and learn by doing. Our goal is to inspire the future leaders of Ethereum. So the challenge here to each and every one of you is to reflect on how you can make a tangible difference using the knowledge you'll gain today. So let's start off with a quick introduction of our guests. First, we have Suprio, uh, who is our topic expert. Um, Suprio, I would love if you could share a little bit about your background and what inspired you to create Atrium. Sounds great. Uh, hey guys, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Suprio. I have been in tech for the last 15 years um, and in crypto, I think for about six years. And uh, mostly um, before uh, Atrium, I was leading product and design at uh, Alexa for their smart home division. Uh, have been an Ethereum native generally for the last couple of years um, and decided to dive in uh, in 21 of uh, doing things full time. Awesome. How did you discover crypto and what got you um, to leave Web2 and go into crypto? Well, um, crypto definitely came through, you know, just an intent of exploring new technology and moonlighting while uh, doing a lot of things I was doing um, in the technology side of it. And the more I dove in, uh, especially towards the later end of 2020, um, what uh, clicked for me was that utilizing NFTs, there was a completely new class of uh, IP ownership uh, which was emerging um, and uh, there was opportunity for a uh, new type of capital to be deployed around uh, IP co-ownership, around uh, you know, credible payment infrastructure and things like that. Awesome. So I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that when you talk more about Atrium. Yeah. Um, in the meanwhile, we're excited also to have Billy here tonight. Uh, Billy has been in the film industry for over a decade. Um, we'll get into your origin story later, but we'd love to understand how you ventured into the world of crypto after working um, in traditional film for so long. Yeah, thanks for the uh, introduction, by the way. Um, yeah, so I started off... Um, you know, in, in film and I, I wanted to transition to being in a more creative role. And I think, you know, if you know anything about film, you know how difficult it is to sort of get into that, those kind of positions. 
Um, and I, I saw the NFT sell by Beeple. And that was really like a watershed moment um, it, because that was when all the eyes from all creatives from around the world and all different disciplines really looked at the space in a different line. It's like, wow, there's, there's really something here, you know, um, you know, when you start digging into the space more and more, you start to realize, oh, there's, you know, all this technology behind, um, behind crypto, you know, the blockchain technology and the sort of opportunities that it enables really excited me. So I kind of dove in the space a little, I haven't been in crypto and, and, uh, web three as long as Supriya has. So, um, you know, I'm still learning every day. Like today, for example, Supriya sent me a little, um, a little pixel art image from base paint um, XYZ. And I was like, wow, that's that's something new. I didn't know you could do on-chain pixel art like that collaboratively. So um, yeah, really exciting space. And I think that's that's really how I just dove right in. I mean, I think crypto is changing so much that everyone's constantly having to learn to keep up. And I also feel um, very similarly in that what drew me into crypto um, more full time was also the cultural aspect and how when you realize that there's this technology that has a specific ethos, um, that ethos, I think, draws in a lot of people. Um, and so we're really excited to have you both tonight. Um, now that the audience knows a bit more about you, um, the first thing we're going to dive into is Suprio's talk. So Suprio, he will be giving us a quick primer on how long form production is done today, because I, for one, know very little about it. Um, and through that, he will cover some challenges in the traditional Web2 model and share how blockchain is enabling Atrium and others to transform the game. So I'll have Suprio come up on stage um, and share his presentation with you for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Well, um, yeah, uh, long form production, right? So uh, long form production, uh, I would mostly cover uh, the aspect of uh, animation, um, not live action, but uh, they are very similar, uh, whether it comes to TV shows or movies. Uh, but ideally, uh, when you see something like a Deadpool or say a Super Mario Bros, right? Like you work backwards, right? What happened? all the way uh, which led to the movie right so when when a production begins um, people start from scratch and they start uh, with story and when you start working with a screenwriter or a group of writers which is basically a writer's room um, you eventually land into what you want to make and then once the story is there you start to uh, graduate towards higher fidelity where it comes to concept art or you know like rough storyboarding seeing how camera angles work seeing how the character demeanor works and things like that and then you continuously ramp up towards more and more degrees of motion so from storyboards comic books you go into um, animatic which are very rough sequences of animation and then from that you start to polish it up over and over and over and as you are further growing towards it um, the team is essentially working in stages so it, it's almost like sculpting right like where you are uh, creating details and emotions and aspects of things uh, pouring all the work into it where it eventually finally leads to uh, what you see on a theatrical release right and for a movie or an actual animated tv show um, 18 months to 24 months is a very um common timeline um i think a more aggressive timeline probably would be like a year but that's very unheard of and yeah moving on from that like knowing how hundreds of people work around these things um you eventually lead to the problems right like when hundreds of people are working on certain things um it costs a lot of money right uh, an, an average animated production on a lower end can cost upwards of 20, 30 million dollars on just the production itself. And then on top of that, many more billions for marketing and awareness and all those kind of campaigns and things like that. And when you're looking at productions, you almost always look at top of the funnel. So for instance, uh, when you were thinking about Despicable Me, right, you would 
probably know Illumination who came up with the Minions, right? And Or you would know about Paramount who came up with Transformers, but you don't know about the people who did the model of uh, the Minions, the people who wrote the story of the Minions, the people who voiced a lot of the cast, um, apart from, you know, Steve Carroll, who just, uh, who, who did uh, Gru. So that essentially showcases that because of that really heavy upfront funding needs and how majority of the representation of the final outcome uh, is just the studio. A lot of the smaller creators who work with these studios just have a very unfair uh, playing game um, where they don't have the same discovery. Most of the audiences don't know how to connect directly with them. Um, and then uh, the distribution itself is essentially controlled by your top streamers or the top production houses. And once you go through that, uh, a lot of the outsiders, whether it's like individual capital or um, uh, people who are smaller brands, right? Like they either can't go fund as much, even if they would want to, or um, they wouldn't basically just know where to start, right? And, and you would never know how much a certain thing costs because you only have access to top level numbers. You only have access to the aggregate budget that, hey, um, Tangled movie cost $160 million. How much of that actually made it to the artists or how much of that was broken down by departments like animation, rigging and voice acting and all of those things, you don't know about those things. So that that all of that essentially is the legacy monolithic model, which can be broken down and can be made more transparent, right? Uh, whether Web 2 or Web 3, uh, there are many alternatives to do that. But uh, for the sake of scope today, uh, Web 3, I would talk about how basically we are trying to do it and how it's uh, easier, right? And more composable data. Um, why now? Uh, I think um, leading from those problems, you can think about uh, my first answer uh, back in 2020, uh, when CryptoPunks were starting to catch the first cycle of awareness, you would see that utilizing a code building block like an NFT, um, a new type of internet native IP was being born right in front of our eyes, right? And then after that, you see Yuga Labs come into play, Azuki's come into play, and then lots of multi-chain stories similarly coming into play as well. You are seeing a new type of wealth, a new type of asset class being created on top of that building block. And now that you have a provable way of IP ownership, the IP owners themselves are getting more and more interested in how can they build value on top of that core primitive. And that's where you can see um, people opening merchandising shops, they're doing commissions, they're doing music videos, all kinds of things, which are essentially derivatives, which are essentially rich media being built on top of um, a core primitive IP. And that's where Atrium comes to play. Um, so what Atrium at its core is, it's it's a aggregator uh, of all kinds of talent, which goes, uh, which is needed for long form production, right? Whether it's animation, um, screenwriting, music production, sound effects, visual effects, all of those things, uh, all aggregated in one place. So it's a market power coordination tool uh, for creating content. Uh, what's different about Atrium is unlike a typical studio, which is brick and mortar, um, it's essentially location based. So they are um, you know, restricted by uh, labor conditions, labor laws, um, a lot of uh, things around uh, production costs and things like that. And also uh, because of those restrictions directly restricted on accessibility of talent. So a lot of people are situated all over the globe, right? Like, do they have the same kind of opportunities which a Disney can provide or, you know, say a Warner Brothers can provide if 
unless you are in LA, for example. So that's where Atrium comes into play. It's a fully remote um, aggregator built on top of Ethereum. We are Ethereum native today, um, where anyone essentially um, who has a certain kind of skill set, they can go and put their skill on chain. So what that means is uh, tomorrow an Atrium can, uh, yeah, an animator can come and say that, hey, I am so-and-so person, I have certain types of experience um, and this is what I can do for you. And then uh, once you define that, you essentially are putting your skill and availability on chain. What that means is you are putting your skill as an NFT for auction or sale, right? So unlike a traditional NFT marketplace where you go and buy the finished good, here you are buying a placeholder. And you essentially are going and seeing that, hey, ABC, say, Suprio uh, said, I would animate for you um, in 45 days uh, and it would cost you this much, right? You define that, you put it up front. And then once that information is live, then people who access Atrium in search for this kind of talent, they come in and buy or you know participate in a public auction to outbid each other um, and eventually land the land the opportunity to work uh, with the artist. So whoever ends up buying that NFT basically is establishing the contract that hey, I hired you for certain services. We'll work together to make it happen. And because they have seen all the listed constraints up front, they are agreeing to it by default. So if if the idea is that let's produce two minutes of animation and X amount of money. That's an established non-negotiable thing, which cannot change later unless, you know, like you are ready to pay up more and which also can be captured on chain. And uh, when you do this over and over, every time the work gets completed, the NFT itself is updated with the final output. So what that does is that not only is establishing a certain type of economic expectation around an artist. It's also establishing on-chain reputation around the artist too. So for instance, if someone is working on a certain piece for two years, um, they over time amass a huge on-chain work history, which they can point out to other people and easily say that, hey, you cannot come in and negotiate with me on numbers because look, this is what other people have paid me. And that that essentially removes the idea of negotiation completely from the picture and um, you know makes it really easy for artists to not deal with selling their skill over and over. You are essentially using uh, whatever the market defined uh, over time for your work, for your work's worth and skills worth as the primary moniker for people to come in and work with you continuously. And, and what this does is um, it's essentially aggregating across the board. So it takes takes out the bar- barrier of entry for establishing a career path for an independent animator. So a lot of times because of these skills, they are very specific. So people are good at a vertical level, but they are not always great on a horizontal level. So an animator might be really, really great on just the aspect of animation, right? But they they might not be great on the modeling side of it. If they were to pursue something like this, by themselves, it would be really hard because when they work in a studio setting, they are paired up with, you know, the modeling department or they are paired up with like lighting artists and things like that. So they they always output as a group. Here, they are constrained by their own limitations. And the idea there is that on Atrium, you can almost pair up with anyone as like a Lego block, right? So if someone comes in and says that I have X amount of budget, um, and I want to produce something, you can essentially take up that work and then you end up becoming the project lead where you can then in turn go and pick somebody else to complement the skill sets you lack. 
And that way you can form a team on demand, form a production queue on demand, which can then uh, dissolve when the project is finished. So th that introduces a really interesting dynamic of lowering the barrier for you to also exist uh, independently as as a uh, as a professional um, and build build your own credentials. And the idea there is that because it's on chain verifiable, you would be cross linked across all of these work outputs. So someone, if they collaborate with you on a certain NFT, they would be listed around um, that work output and vice versa. So you both parties would basically, basically always be credited for things they would output. And that uh, that helps st helps in building not just the person who is the main point of POC, but also people who are in you know, like secondary uh, relationship working with people um, on a certain part of project. What here you are seeing in, in this chart is essentially an, a, a very small example of um, an artist who started with Atrium, right? So before Atrium, that dotted line, um, when 3D print guy started, he he comes from background of Pixar, uh, Stella credentials. Um, when he started in Web3, um, the idea there was that, oh, okay, I will take smaller commissions and things like that. And the the idea of this was really broken, uh, broken in a sense that there was no tooling to support him on his journey, right? So he would go and message people who potentially could do something like this, whether it's, you know, like other NFT holders or companies directly called out to outreach DMs and things like that. And almost always would end up underselling what potentially the market could uh, provide for his skill, right? And the moment he moved away from that and went the auction route on a place like Atrium, suddenly that skill was up for grab across the board for everybody. So people saw um, how how much value this person was bringing on a certain project and they were willing to outbid themselves to you know get get a guaranteed portion of time with him right and what that did was that uh, increased his earning potential by 10x right and he, he essentially what that ended up happening what that ended up doing was that um, the artist was able to realize to their full potential what they can actually make versus what they were doing over dms and emails and other kind of conversations. And uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that essentially concludes uh, what we have been up to. And, uh, you know, like we have been able to do this for dozens and dozens of artists. Yeah, I love that. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that talk. Um, I think you did a really great job of highlighting where traditional film models or production models are broken and that studios centralize a lot of power and how this sort of gatekeeps as uh, both financially as well as um, the discovery of talent and then touching on how on-chain reputation, auction models, and just being able to empower a global um, network and talent pool. Um, I think that's a really compelling model that you're bringing to the table. So. Next up, um, we are going to hear from Billy. So Billy Dow has been actually working with uh, Atrium for a while. So we sort of get to hear the flip side of the creator story. And so Billy, um, as we mentioned before, he's been in the film industry for over a decade, has worked on a ton of great films from Marvel movies to Age of Adeline. Um, I'm really excited to hear more about uh, Billy's background on how he got started in film, how he found Atrium and some of the work that he's been doing with Atrium. And I think with this example, what we hope to highlight um, is the creator perspective of how um, a blockchain enabled model like Atrium is um, helping creators live out their fullest potential. So with that, I'll let you, Billy, take it away. Thanks, Tina. Um, yeah, so actually, I, I started off in advertising. Um, it's like a little dark secret of mine, <laughs> but um, it was a little boutique studio in um, in Sydney, working on a lot of different ads, um, all the way from you know your small Australian uh, advertising, uh, you know, like companies, all the way to 
big ones. Like we worked on like a bunch of Unilever stuff in the past. Uh, and then I wanted to trans- transition to film because film was kind of like the holy grail of a 3D artist. Um, you get to work on the the highest quality stuff. So uh, for the past decade, I've I've been um, working on um, at Luma Pictures on a bunch of different films. I think I count somewhere around like 40 features now. Um, we've done like TV series, like for like kids TV. And I also worked on a Super Bowl, um, Super Bowl ad. So uh, quite a lot of like different varying um, projects in the past. And then, you know, like you mentioned, there's like a lot of those AAA blockbuster films from Marvel and, and whatnot. But then there's some more indie, you know, thought provoking films, uh, introspective pieces like Age of Adeline and uh, Jojo Rabbit and, uh, you know, f- films like King Richard and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so from there, I, I realized very quickly what the film industry was actually like, uh, having been in visual effects for so long, you could sort of see the way uh, VFX vendors operate, how they interact with uh, the film studios themselves, and you realize there's no easy way to cross that barrier. Um, there's a common saying, you're either below the line or above the line in um, in film. And being below the line is sort of like, you know, your your uh, average 3D artist or uh, even like a VFX supervisor and whatnot would still be considered below the line. And then you have people like your producers, your um, directors and whatnot who are above the line. So crossing that threshold above the line has been notoriously difficult. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about some of the issues, I'm sure, um, in in um, the next few questions. But um, that, that was a big hurdle of mine. And I knew I just couldn't do that within the industry that I was in. So I had to sort of find a way around that. And that's kind of when I discovered, um, you know, like crypto, NFTs, Web3, and all the opportunities that that kind of brought. It was almost like a way to sidestep this um, this sort of rigged system uh, and then uh, really become a creator on my own terms, which was the ultimate goal. Um, and Crazily, <laughs> crazily enough, like here I am now, uh, getting to live out that dream, uh, at least the start of it, and uh, it's been like really exciting. Um, but largely, that was possible because um, having partnered up with Atrium. So I think I'm actually the, if I'm not mistaken, I might be the the, the second artist to have onboard on Atrium uh, after 3D Print Guy. So um, yeah, have have been with Atrium for a long time now, and we've worked on a whole bunch of different uh, projects. Um, from like a like a, I think it was like the very first animated music video f- for like um, a bored apes character, uh, Shilly, and that was really fun. And then you know now moving on to doing the Nouns movie. So yeah, it's a uh, it's been a wild ride. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, I th- I would love to hear you talk a bit more about the Nouns movie and. Um, specifically, how um, working in Web 2 versus Web 3 um, unlocks new creative potential, right? And so I was reading um, your blog on the Atrium and Nouns Collab, and there seems to be this hypothesis there that uh, when you have smaller production companies and independent content creators, the stories that they get to tell are more personal and um, it, it sort of changes like the nature of what you're creating. And so would love to see um, from your perspective how um, working on something like Nouns has contrasted with the different processes you took with a centralized studio production. Yeah. Um, so like we're completely different than a traditional studio, like from almost like every aspect um, not saying that traditional studios are bad by any means in, in terms of like a lot of the processes that they, that, that they have. Um, but I think we, we really set out to try to reinvent um, based on what we've learned. So we, as in me and my co-director, he's, he came from um, an animation uh, background. So animated features like Lego Movie, you know, Jacob and the, and the Sea Beast, um, those, those kind of films. Uh, and we really kind of joined forces to study like what was going wrong in the film industry and what can we change. So I think the one of the interesting aspects of the Nouns movie is the way it was funded. So that was completely different than anything that's ever been done before. I would, I would say being funded by Nouns DAO, so a completely decentralized organization, 
um, run, you know, by a CC0, uh, you know, like this CC0 NFT IP project is completely wild. Um, and, you know, anyone being able to propose um, any any idea to announce DAO to have them vote on it and execute it if, if they um, think it's valuable to the project. And uh, that's that's sort of how we funded the film. So that's really one of the biggest unlocks, I think, in in the Web three space is all the different funding models that we've mm-hmm. kind of enabled um, with NFT launches and all that sort of stuff. So the Nows movie specifically, um, once it was funded, we're, we're funding it in stages. So we did the pilot first um, with the first chunk of funding, and that was almost like a proof of concept to to Nows community. To say like, hey, we have the skills. We have like the um, we can assemble a team. We have the the um, the quality that we're outputting is is there. So it's really um, up to you guys now if you want to keep funding this. And they loved the output, and they they decided to fund the next part, uh, and and that came out really well as well. And now we're doing the next three parts. So I think um, that's from just like a high level perspective. Not even talking about the the workflow and processes that. Um, HK, my co-director and I, like not even talking about those processes that we've changed on our end to produce the film. I, I think um, from a funding um, on-chain perspective, I think that's like a really interesting um, sort of thing that's that's uh, changed. But, yeah. yeah, I will actually also really love if you could expand a bit. And um, when you first discover blockchain and you first dipped your toes in, like what kept you going? and working in blockchain. What was so exciting to you that drew you and what what led you to stay? I think um, really it was it was just like the un the unlimited possibilities. Uh, so it was it's very clear how the film industry operated at least from my perspective having been in there for so long. I could see that there's there's a ceiling for almost everybody mm-hmm. and to cross that uh, to cross that barrier or to break through that ceiling um, you'd have to you'd have to know someone. It's it's really just like this big nepotistic kind of uh, rigged system almost, like the film industry. So when it came to blockchain and Web three, everything from like the ethos of it, um, how it it it's it was like sort of anti centralization. It's like it's all about decentralization um, and just the transparency aspects. Like those were promises of of crypto and Web three that. I sort of held on to because I knew there was inherent value to them having come from the opposite side of the spectrum, seeing how how things could just like, it, it's just like a very unhealthy system. Uh, you could see all that play out in real time, you know, with the strikes and stuff like that. So there's no need for me to convince people how broken it is. Um, so I think really crypto and Web3, um, that the whole ethos, everything it was designed for, it, it really is sort of like a like a, a solution to all that those problems. So I really held on to that. But also I was seeing sort of uh, returns. Um, mm-hmm. Having only spent a year in NFT space, I was already seeing returns on on like the work that I've been putting out. Um, and you know, partnering up with Atrium, for example, that was like the first big step in okay. Now I can really actually do this full time, replace my job completely. I have way more creative freedom and it's way more fun. Uh, so it, it wasn't really like I had to hold on to anything. It was just it, it, <laughs> it things just played out in real time really easily for me. So um, yeah, it's, it's love that. It's, uh, yeah. Love that. So now we're going to move towards the workshop um, section where we have more of a conversation with both speakers. Uh, And if this conversation inspires any new questions, please drop them in Discord. Um, We also have some questions that we've gathered from our community. Um, But in the meanwhile, I think one thing I want to refresh for the audience is our core topic for this workshop is really around how blockchain enables new work models, right? And so far, we're talking about how Atrium is enabling new work models for creatives in long form production. And so just to, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the traditional film industry so far, how Atrium is doing things differently with blockchain. We've highlighted Billy's path and also his work with Atrium. But just so the point doesn't get lost in the flow of things, I would love if um, 
one or both of you could sort of summarize for us how employment really has changed in, within the context of blockchain, right? And um, perhaps a expanded question here could be, um, how do you see this decentralized employment model expand to other verticals outside of um, the long form production that you're focused on? Yeah, I, I can touch on that. I think um, uh, long form production model, like if we abstract it away, it's at its core uh, skills and services. Um, and uh, that could be anything right? like that could be uh, graphic design that could be uh, writing for copy that that, that could be uh, development even right and and the idea there is that origin credentials could be something which don't need to stay in a walled garden um, in a sense that they are composable credentials right so when when someone works for a DAO as a DAO contributor, like you can see their work history, you can see their work history through governance, through things they have created, all of those things accessible on chain. And tomorrow, if they were to leave the DAO, it's not that that work history is erased. So that could actually carry forward very easily, um, which you probably wouldn't think would be the case um, if someone were to work with a platform like Upwork and then they get get the platform for some reason, mm -hmm. right? Like all of that history is just gone. And uh, they would have to start from scratch, rely on connections and things like that. So it becomes very unpredictable. So I think that's one of the aspects where it, differentiates. Another aspect is essentially um, mimicking similar models people are used to. So for instance, um, if you are working um, in Atrium's context, we almost always go for people settling what the project budget is on chain. So if you are working on a project which is about creating an animation, right, we are not relying on haggling with people that, hey, work is done, send us payment, invoices, all of those things, right? So a lot of that manual work is taken away and it's settling on chain immediately when they're buying things. So that de-risks the person working uh, almost immediately right at the front. And um, that's one of the ways where, you know, like um, it's inherently trust based and that trust comes from their credentials, which they're establishing. And the second aspect is that if you don't want to go that route, you can go about things with like streaming protocols, right? Like where people are getting paid over a period of time, like an actual salary. So that can create a very predictable uh, working environment for a person who essentially is working with people um, where, you know, like they, they understand that they would have a paycheck at a certain amount of time, right? And that, that's a second aspect, I think, which is really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting because effectively what you're saying is like right now, the way that people are getting new jobs, even in a Upwork context, is with like a resume or with something that they're specifically marketing about themselves. And even right. with platforms like Upwork, it's like your review um, that a customer may, may, a customer may or may not have left you. And so like in the blockchain contest, it's like if you've done the work um, and the IP is, for instance, an NFT that lives on chain and you're able to sort of assign um, like almost micro... Um, responsibility, right, to different creators. Um, like, for instance, when Billy was talking about collaborating with a co-founder, um, like whoever is contributing to that IP all have some um, ownership over it. So, yeah, yeah that, that's a really compelling superpower of blockchain, uh, which I think we've alluded to in the past around transparency. Um, yeah. And transparency is not just like a core ethos, it's also... Um, something that truly lives uh, in the technology. Yeah. Um, and so on this topic of transparency, um, I think it would be helpful to hear you both contrast um, the crypto world's um, ethos of transparency against that of um, traditional media. Um, I would love to, to just like 
um, focus our conversation more um, on examples like Hollywood accounting or, you know, the, the different ways that um, traditional world isn't as um, transparent and how this transparency has impacted the way that creatives um, interact with both um, content and financial transactions. Right. I, I, um, Billy, do you want to take that and I can add it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I can start from the creative perspective. Um, so as you guys know, the strikes um, uh, with the writers and the actors uh, largely revolved around the lack of transparency. So uh, when it came to streaming services, for example, you just didn't have any insight into the metrics whatsoever. Uh, you didn't have any insight into, uh, yeah, like things like viewership count, um, things like the stream, like stream count, et cetera, uh, and how much people were being paid. So the lack of um, royalties, transparency in the streaming world, or just like inherently the lack of royalties, uh, period, uh, is like one of the big um, contention points of the strikes. So um, I think that's something that largely gets solved with um, blockchain technology. Like you could see how the accounting is broken down um, to um, like percentages, like based on like uh, the work done, right? So you could define that all in a smart contract, for example, and and just have that being paid out automatically. And that's something that it just takes all that sort of... Um, that opaqueness out of the equation and people can finally just do what they're supposed to do and just be creatives uh, for the sake of, yeah, being creatives and not trying to just fight for their survival. Um, so yeah, that, I think in that sense, um, I, that's something that uh, once um, there's still a lot of infrastructure being built out around that, but I think, you know, I, we've, you know, Supriya and I have had many talks with a lot of different creators in the space who are trying to, tackle that problem as well as we're trying to tackle that problem on our end in our own way as well. So um, I think when all that infrastructure is finally built out, uh, you'll I think you'll start to see just a natural shift of all sort of creatives from all different disciplines coming into the space just for that one aspect mm -hmm. alone, let alone all the other uh, benefits that um, you know Web3 comes with. But yeah. I'll let Supriya talk about the, the zero accounting stuff and, and all the other stuff. <laughs> I, I think uh, Hollywood accounting is interesting because um, it goes all the way back to the point of opaqueness. Like, for instance, the movie Tangle, you know, like costs costed $160 million, right? And where did that go, right? Like, so you don't know how many people worked on the project because that data is confidential you don't know whether that money was spent on star cast or that money was primarily spent on executives. Um, and that uh, essentially is the lack of transparency. On top of that, when the movie actually airs, right, and it, say, made hundreds of millions of dollars on the box office, it deemed a success. Are there residuals which actually went to the production crew, the people who burned the midnight oil to make it? Um, I think those are the things which you just fundamentally cannot do on blockchain because of the nature of public ledger. So people will find out sooner or later, uh, check the chain, right? So I think in, in, in that sense, what happens is um, utilizing blockchain, you can exactly define uh, at a contribution percentage level how much what person is making right and then whether you know like if it's animation department which is being like the biggest heavy hitter in a bigger production majority of the revenue goes to them right so and and you can see that happening through and then um because of the aspect of split contracts and sp similar things existing on chain you can also say that hey now you you uh produced this because you financed it uh expressly so if the money act if the company or the production makes money then this goes back into the split contract and then it gets split again in form of residuals giving money back to the financiers and giving money back to the talent as well and that money flow also you can see when it starts to happen so that way i think it's not just uh, during production transparency of how funds are being spent, but post-production as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's just 
I, I don't see that happening uh, on on a non blockchain world. Right. So so far we've we've talked a lot about um, transparency, both in terms of um, financial transparency um, as well as like reputational transparency. We've also touched on um, how blockchain um, has really enabled new funding models for um, film production or um, long form content production. I have um I have another question, and then I'm going to move on to a live. Q and A, and then we'll wrap up the conversation. But um, one thing we've touched on in the past, and Billy, you touched on um, in your talk, was how um, blockchain has sort of enabled you to explore new workflows and creative processes. Specifically, you previously mentioned this idea of um, like building in the public, which wasn't previously available. Um, and so I would love for you to just um, expand a bit more on how blockchain, aside from these financial equations, is also benefiting some creativity um, for how artists are working today and how these workflows are changing. Yeah, so um, as, as I'm sure everyone's aware, but Hollywood is just incredibly secretive in terms of anything that gets shown. Um, it basically you don't see anything about a movie until the trailer drops or until the the, the actual film comes out, um, and uh, they have like their own weird ways of testing the film with like friends and families and whatnot. Um, but largely, it's it's very just a closed door sort of thing. Um, whereas we like working on like a project like Nouns, which is CC zero, we have so much freedom to showcase the work. We don't have studio execs telling us like, hey, you can't show this or you can't show that. So we have this like really open, um, like a transparent um, work sort of um, workflow, I guess, when we do something uh, and it's ready to, it's ready, like it's approved, we can show it to the public, get the nouns community to sort of react to it, uh, get their input uh, if they have feedback or they have input. So we're kind of involving other people from like the the nouns community and also the broader community to sort of like just get involved in the film, get excited, um, and it also helps like for marketing purposes, like getting um, you know people to retweet the the concept art or um, yeah retweet some clips that we've released, uh, and we're able to showcase everything from you know early concept work all the way to just like rough animation uh, and compare that with like the final output. Because I think all that sort of stuff is the kind of BTS stuff that you really want to see in a film, but it's like you only get little glimpses of it. And a lot of the time, the BTS stuff that you see in film, it's all BS. It's all <laughs> faked. Like they just shoot it after the fact. And it's not really BTS. Uh, it's it's kind of like stage BTS. So I think well, what we're doing, you actually get it, um, you know, see behind the scenes. Like you actually get to see the concepts that we're developing, the early versions of the designs like the real early versions. So a big, um, another big gripe I have is a lot of the concept books, the art of books that get released. Like most, most of that stuff is just like done after the facts. <laughs> I mean, some of it is legitimate, but some of it, some of it is just, you know, paint overs from the actual film. So um, it's, it's all like a uh, facade. Whereas I, I feel like being able to showcase our work as mm. we go really uh, keeps us accountable as creatives, but also gives the community insight and uh, involves them into the film. So yeah, I yeah. think that's a huge difference. I love that because it, it really is your, because um, I think we we had um, the founders of Saw on Sound um, on a workshop recently too, and they're creating a platform for artists. And they said something very similar in that with crypto, you're sort of like engaging your fans as you go. So you're constantly co-creating with fans and then you're sort of turning the fans from just a consumer to someone that's um, a co-collaborator in some ways of the process. And so I, I think that's a really powerful um, like way to enforce psychological ownership in some ways. Yeah. Um, and okay, so I guess um, uh, since we're running on low on time, I'm going to move on to a live Q and A and then recap with both of you on paths to get involved. Um, so I'll bring up Jolene to the stage. Jolene, if you could 
um, just give us a quick intro of yourself and then ask your questions. That'd be great. Hi, my name is Jolene. Um, I'm a youth member. So my question is, um, are there any specific genres or types of films that are more suitable for Web3 models? I, I would say uh, from a production standpoint, almost everyone is suitable for a Web3 model. Um, and that there are quite a few companies who are trying to do this um, in terms of live action, in terms of horror, sci-fi, not just animation. So I think um, the same fundamental pieces of how films are made is there and animation is just one of the types. Thank you. Um, another question I have is what are like the challenges to promote um, fair and global opportunities for artists worldwide? Yeah, I think um, like blockchain fundamentally doesn't care where people come from, right? So like people can be anonymous, but if their credentials are out there, right? Like it's very easy to work with someone who has done certain things in the past or, you know, like can, you can reference check through the chain instead of relying on what they say. Um, and I think it, it becomes really, really uh, interesting um, as, as like a company as a company or as a culture, which is generally remote first, right? We see that not only on like the gig economy side of it, but also like core employments. So like a lot of blockchain based companies today are very distributed. Like they don't rely on in-person offices as much as they used to. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, appreciate your questions. I think um, her questions actually inspired a question for me, which is, you know, if there's all these benefits for both creators and even others who might be producers effectively who are searching for staffing um, in this manner, like right. what is preventing you from scale? Like what do you view is the toughest scaling challenges with crypto? Right. I, I, I think um, it it also directly comes from like the awareness side of it. Like essentially, if someone is wanting to start their like on chain journey, right, like certain fundamental concepts of like having a wallet, having an address, interacting with these properties which stay on chain, I think. Uh, there is an educational barrier and hence University of Ethereum <laughs> comes yeah. into picture. Um, um, and I, I think, but more and more people, like the amount of animators who were not privy to something like this two years ago, that has been changing rapidly. Uh, and a lot of companies are essentially leading the way, but not just on Ethereum, on other chains as well. Yeah, I definitely understand that because... Uh... Whenever I first entered crypto, it was a huge um, burden, right, on the consumer to learn about how do you use a wallet, how do you protect your assets, and all these things. Um, so definitely, education is advancing, um, and hopefully, we're abstracting a lot of the educational burden away from consumers. Um, and maybe that will bring more folks into the Web three universe. Um, cool. So uh, we're coming up on the last few minutes of the session. Um, so for the last few minutes, um, I would love for you speakers to share how either you ETH members can get involved in your projects or any last parting words that you might have for them. So maybe uh, Suprio would love if you could give us a quick download on um, how to get involved with atriums and other models like atrium in the film space in crypto. Um, okay. I know you onboard people all the time. So how do people find you and um, perhaps apply to be part of your network? Right. Yeah. So atrium, um, check out atrium.art. Uh, that's the website. Um, we are on Discord. We are on Twitter um, and we onboard people like continuously. So one of the easy ways is to just reach out, hop on Discord and DM us and somebody will get back to you. Or, um, you know, you can also use the form down below on the page, on the main homepage on Atrium to just submit an intent and then someone can get back to you as well. And uh, uh, apart from Atrium, I think uh, within the film space, like you can search by the hashtag of film three. There are tons of 
people who are building adjacent things in terms of tooling, infra, other things as well. Cool. I didn't realize that's what um, the... It is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, all right, Billy. Um, so your final words, I'd love to have you share a bit more for um, our members as well as our students. Um, how to get started in film um, because I think, you know, the, the film industry in general, the barrier is quite high. So um, we'll love any words of advice and parting wisdom that you're willing to share. Yeah. I'm, I, th I think starting in traditional film is, is a very different um, roadmap than I guess starting in uh, film three, for example, um, and if I, if I had to give recommendation, I would say like if you're a new filmmaker, um, it's always good to have the experience in traditional film industry to see some of the processes that do take place. And to, to get in trad-like media, it's really just any job, like just get any job possible and then learn, try to transition to the roles that you want to do. Um, again, it's very difficult to do. Um, but for film three, I think just being involved in the space so, so much of Web3 at the moment is, is very um, networking based. So you meet a lot of people just based on like DMing people, um, just being active on, on places like X uh, and really just kind of immersing yourself into the space, learning who the players are, learning uh, who's building what. And I think that really gives you a good broad uh, overview of like the landscape of uh, Film 3. And from there, you know, you, you can like spur on your own ideas of like, oh, these, there's like a gap here that nobody's sort of building in. And I can, um, if I'm a dev, I can sort of jump in there and, and, and sort of fill, fill that demand. I mean, like, like I said before, like all the infrastructure is still being built out. So there's so much need for inf infrastructure for, for films, for example, um, like large productions. Uh, to assemble a team for a large production requires so much um just so much infrastructure and we're s still very much in the early days that's why you don't see these massive web3 productions uh coming out just yet so i think um there's like definitely a demand for for more infrastructure for more build out in the space um just along the same ideas of what we were discussing but yeah like i, I would say just being immersed in the space is is definitely the the number one thing i think to to get into the space Thanks for that. And where, where can people catch the nouns movie? Nouns dot movie. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, cool. That's a wrap for tonight. Um, we'll catch you again next week um, on Wednesday with new guests. And as always, at UETH, our intention with workshops is to inspire everyone with real world examples so that you can find projects in, in, that inspire you to participate and learn by doing. So would love if you all take it some time to reflect on what you learned here today um, and uh, see if you can make a tangible difference using blockchain. So thanks again to our guests. Um, everything you shared was amazing. We'll drop a recap into our newsletter and then we'll have a blog post out about this topic in the next few weeks. Um, and with that, it's a wrap for tonight. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you.